As many of you know, Betsy and I attended a very small, uh, very conservative Baptist Bible College in the middle of Iowa. When I say very conservative, I mean very conservative. There were rules on everything. Every matter of life had rules um, the school had imposed on us. For example, um, you know, one thing you might want to do as a college student is go out and watch movies. No. Not allowed to go to the movie theater. So maybe you're going to want to watch one in your dorm room or with a friend at their house. Well, in the dorm room, the law was firmly established and maintained that if you were going to watch a movie, it could have zero swear words and it could never take the Lord's name in vain. So that, like, the amount of movies that are made gets very, very small there. And technically, even if you were off campus, that was the rule. Um, we had very strong rules on music. So um, even a lot of the songs that we sing on a Sunday morning, we would not have been allowed to listen to at that school. The, the president of the school was famous for when he would go around, um, you know, they go to different churches to try to get churches to support, send kids that way. His saying was, at Faith Baptist Bible College, there's no Bach, there's no rock. So you can imagine, again, very narrow margin of what you're allowed to deal with. Now, I've heard that since I left, you know, not everybody had cell phones then, now everybody does. So it's kind of like, how do you handle that? So they made a rule that if your headphones are on, no one's going to ask. Just only listen to music with headphones on. Um, but needless to say, all those rules amounted to there wasn't a whole lot to do. Got done with classes. Usually we started at 7 in the morning, ended at usually noon. Um, and not a whole lot to do after that unless you worked. Um, and even if you worked, you still end up with a lot of free time when you're a college student, not married, no kids yet. Um, so you got to find something. So, you, so what we would typically do is go to Walmart. <laughs> that was like the thing. Every day, sometimes we'd go and leave one of our friends there because that was always funny. Um, <laughs> but that's what we had to do is we'd go to Walmart. You know, we'd find some games to play in the aisles and stuff like that. But um, the biggest draw to Walmart was probably the clearance aisle. Because they had a, this, the AP Walmart just had this huge clearance aisle, the biggest clearance aisle that I had ever seen. So we would go through, and sometimes you'd find something just really goofy. Like, it's on clearance because nobody bought it because it should have never been made. So college students buy it. Oh, go, I found Or you'd find really good deals. Now, I remember this one time, um, I had, what I would do, you had, like, even as a 21-year-old, 22-year-old, you had to, if you wanted to leave campus, like, overnight on the weekend, you had to go to your RA, fill out a form, this is where I'm going, this is when I'll get back. It was like my parents were less strict on me than the school was. So when I had a friend that we were roommates for half of my second year, then he, he dropped out and moved off campus with a friend that lit, worked for the school. Um, so he was technically off campus even though his apartment was owned by the school. So I went to my RA, I said, this is what I'm gonna do. Every weekend I'm staying at his place. I'm just gonna, can I just fill this out once? They said, no. I was like, well, uh, the, can I, like, sure, fine, they wanted me out of the dorms. Um, so, because I was always causing problems, and Dan can attest to some of the things that happened. Um, they said, fine, go stay at your friend's house, we won't make you fill this out every week. So we were out one Friday night, and we were in Walmart in the clearance aisle, and there it was. For like three or five dollars, there was this huge box of poker goodies. There was this little caddy that all the chips like went in really nicely, and the cards, had a place to go and, and all that fun stuff We're like, oh, we should play poker. Now we didn't gamble or anything like that because that's immediate explanation if you get caught gambling. Uh, we just played and had fun, but that became our thing that every Friday night for a while we'd go to my friend's house, do the Papa John's College one topping $6.99 special, uh, have some pizza, and way too much Mountain Dew, and uh, play cards. And, and without fail, every week I had one friend that halfway through the game would like, you know what we should do? Instead of using, we should have the chips represent change. So like, this one could be a penny and this could be a nickel. I'm like, I get kicked out if we do that. What am I gonna do like, oh wow, I won 75 cents. Got kicked out of school, but you know, it was worth it. <laughs> but, so we'd always shoot that down. And then our, my friend that had the apartment, he would lose his job, so that was a big no. But I never got very good at poker, but we had a lot of fun. Poker is, it's a very dramatic game. You start out, you have your cards, you see how well you're going to do, you're, 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 you know, there's multifaceted because it's not just the cards you have, but how are you going to play your chips to try to get the other person to do what you want them to do, and, and at the end there's the dramatic showdown where you throw your cards down and everybody 
um, gets to see who wins, and or you can bluff your way through some things. Um, in Philippians chapter 3, there's a sense in which the Apostle Paul takes on these false teachers and says, you know what, I'll play your game. And in some senses, he handles it like a poker game. So I want us to turn to Philippians chapter 3 together and look at this, uh, this passage as Paul does this. So please stand with me. Uh, we're going to look at verses 4 through 7 today, but I would like us to read 1 through 10 for context. So Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am more so. Circumcised the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning, the zeal, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being, con being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Tim Taylor, will you pray for us this morning as we get started? Father God, in Jesus' name, we ask once again for your presence to be here. We ask that you be with Pastor Bob and, and that you bring up all that you told him this week. And, 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 and let, give them clear their thought, clear their focus, and give our hearts, prepare our hearts to hear your word. Take out anything that's in us, in our hearts and minds, that will stop your word from getting through. Prepare our hearts to hear your word, and prepare our hearts to live your word. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So if you remember, in, this con in the context of the passage of Philippians chapter 3, there was this group known as the Judaizers that would go around from church to church, and the apostles would come through and preach the gospel. And they would come through and they'd say, you know what, that's great that you heard these things, but what they forgot to tell you is you do need to trust Christ, but in order to really be saved, you also need to keep the law, and most importantly, you need to be circumcised. You need to have this, this religious ritual done. They are, in essence, blending faith and works. So the Apostle Paul, in many passages of the New Testament, many of the epistles, comes back to this, to, to, to come back to uh, confronting this false teaching. <coughs> And that's exactly what he is doing in chapter 3. And it start, well, the way that he has his defense, he, he more or less says, okay, you know what, this is what they taught you? Fine. Let's play that game for the sake of argument. They're coming in and they're teaching you to have confidence in the flesh. If there is anyone who can have confidence in the flesh, it's me. So Paul starts with the cards that he was dealt. He starts with, in verse 5, he says that he was circumcised the eighth day. Converts to Judaism were circumcised in maturity. Ishmaelites were circumcised in their 13th year. So he's showing that he is neither a heathen nor an Ishmaelite. Now it's, it's significant that he starts with this, because again, this was these false teachers' highest thing. You need to be circumcised. And Paul is letting them know, I'm not coming as an outsider that doesn't know what's going on. I, you, you can't get this ritual done better than me. I have it perfectly. It'd be one thing for someone to some Gentile to come in and be like, yeah, I know they're teaching that, but that's not important. It's kind of like, um, are you ever doing something that you like do regularly and you're like you run into someone in Walmart, like, hey, I did that one time, and here's what you need to know about this thing that you're an expert in. It's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. You don't give them much credit. Paul is saying, I I know what I'm talking about. I was raised in this. I have done this ritual has been performed. I was circumcised the eighth day. So he speaks of the rituals. He speaks of his heritage. He says he is of the stock of Israel. Again, he's not a convert. He is truly from the people of Israel. He even knows which tribe he's from. He says of the tribe of Benjamin. He was not from one of the lost tribes, but from that which gave Israel its first king, 
which alone was faithful to Judah at the separation under Rehoboam, and which had always held the post of honor in the army. Benjamin was the only of the twelve patriarchs who was actually born in the land of promise. Mordecai, the deliverer of the Jews, came and was a Benjamite, and Paul's own name, Saul, is probably derived from Saul of Kish, the Benjamite who was the first king. Then we're already getting into a time in Israel history where people were starting to lose that, that history of who would have been from what tribe. They might know, well, I'm an Israelite, but not from who? Not, I don't know from what tribe. And Paul is able to say, I am truly from Israel. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. He speaks of his culture when he says that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, it's easy to read that and think that he's saying, amongst the Hebrews, I am best. But what he's most likely referring to is, again, um, the land of Israel was not an autonomous nation at this time. They were under Roman rule and authority. Paul was a Roman citizen. And many Jews had started to assimilate more into the culture of that day. They may have had the lineage of an Israelite, but they no longer spoke Hebrew. They spoke Greek. They no longer held their, their long-held traditions and customs, but they started to adopt the customs of the land. And Paul is saying, I know all these things. I, I'm a Roman citizen, but... First and foremost, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. My family has maintained our culture. We still speak Hebrew. We still um, do all the things that go along as part of that culture. So starting out, he, he, he can't get much better than where he starts, the cards that he was dealt with. But then he has that opportunity in his life where he has been able to make improvements. He has. He's traded up. In the middle of verse 5, it says, Concerning the law... A Pharisee. Now, for you and I, when we hear that word Pharisee, that is a negative thing right off the bat. We would only use that word to insult someone or to, to criticize them. But remember that in this day, the Pharisees were a very highly, very highly esteemed group of people. They were the ones that were held in regard as possessing the correct interpretation of the law. They were the ones that, that not only knew what it said, but had taken painstaking effort to keep the law even if it was warped into more of a man-centered idea of the law. So he said, you're going to go around and tell people to keep the law? I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, this um, character trait of zeal was one of the most highly respected traits amongst the Israelite people. Because it not only included to love what is good, but a passionate hatred for what is evil. Uh, when I remember one of the first times that I, I met my father-in-law, we, you know, we talk about all the kind of things that, that you talk to me about someone, you know, where'd you grow up? You know, what kind of things did you do? What do you do for a job? You like any sports team? So, you know, he knew that I liked the Cubs, and he was willing to go along with that. Um, he knew that I liked the Bears. So then we talked about college sports. I said, well, do you, do you have any college teams? And I said, you know, I like to watch college sports, but I, there's no team that I really would say that's my team. I, and... and I didn't think this through. It's just what came out, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I said, because it's just, I, I can't imagine myself hating a college team. They're just students. And he said, I didn't ask you if you hate anybody. I said, do you, is there a team you like? And he said, that, you're a Chicagoan. You guys can't love a team without hating another team. And I said, that's right. To love the Cubs is to hate the White Sox. <laughs> to love the Bears is to hate the Packers. And I'm not even that much of a hockey fan but that I know that to love the Blackhawks is to hate the Red Wings. There's just that love and hate that go together. And the Israelites, when it came to the idea of the law, when it came to their heritage, this zeal, this blend of love and hate was very important to them. Remember, God had given them the law. God had given them the land. God had given them so many things. And when we read the Old Testament, from our vantage point, it's easy to see that they were meant, it even says, you should be a light to the nations, that God was going to use Abraham to bless all the nations of the world. But in their zeal, they said, we are God's people. We have the truth, and they don't. And instead of breaking their hearts and saying, so we will teach them the truth, we will declare the goodness of our God to the ends of the earth, they hated the others. They despised the Gentiles. They despised the Samaritans. And Paul said, I went so far that I didn't just have that much zeal, that kind of zeal. When there was this new way coming about following the man Jesus, I didn't just say, they're bad. I just didn't say, I don't like them. I persecuted them. I saw to it that they were put in jail. That they were put to death for their faith. Can't get much more zealous than that. He says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, 
blameless. Now notice this is not a claim of sinlessness, but of fidelity to the Old Testament law. The Old Testament prescribes way of life. Paul's obedience to the law is honorable. But even he would admit in Romans 7 that the law taught him that he was a sinner. So he's not claiming sinlessness, but as far as man can tell, as far as what is outside, all these things that this, these Judaizers want you to do and want you to put faith in, I've done them. I have excelled in them. You cannot surpass where I was. And essentially he's starting that showdown part of the game where now he has laid down all his cards. And you see, you cannot beat me. And even with this wonderful hand that man cannot beat, look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss. For what? For Christ. Notice that he doesn't say, these things I have counted loss for Christianity. He's not just replacing one set of religion with another. He's not just simply exchanging the one system of rites and ceremonies for a superior system. He's not setting aside one set of doctrines, rules, and regulations for another set. Many people think that changing the religion or finding the right religion is what God wants from them. That's what conversion means. Paul says, I have counted these all lost for Christ, yes. my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the man, the, the God himself. He speaks in a very transactional tone. All these things that he thought were so wonderful, that he thought were so great, he has taken from the gain column and placed in there instead a loss. And a few verses he'll go even far, farther and say, all these things I now count as rubbish, which literally means I count them as dung. There's no benefit to them. There's nothing helpful from them. They cannot merit favor in the eyes of God. There is no basis for confidence in these things. So essentially he calls us to come to this passage and say, fine, go ahead, stack it all up. Were you born in a Christian family? Dedicated or baptized as an infant? Were your parents faithful in service? Maybe you were homeschooled in top of the co-op. Maybe you studied, studied under Pastor Steve even during the Romans years. Did you go through FD and memorize the, the weekly verses, the longer verses, the challenge verses? Did you play piano at Sycamore Village? Were you part of the worship team? Did you go on the Mexico missions trips? All these things are wonderful things, but if this is what we are looking at for confidence to stand before God, it will never do. God does not merely accept good people. He radically saves sinners for His glory. And if we are caught in thinking of these things that we can do as somehow giving us favor in God, we can't be more wrong. In fact, if we're trying to work to earn salvation or trying to work to earn favor in God's sight, we're not bringing ourselves closer to God. We're putting ourselves farther in debt. Turn to Romans chapter 4, the passage that you read earlier. Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What then shall we say, that Abraham our father was found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Eventually in Isaiah we'll get to that, the famous passage that says, even our righteousness is as filthy rags. If we're trying to work to earn favor before God, if we're trying to do enough good deeds to earn His pleasure, we actually put ourselves farther in debt because first and foremost, we deny the truth that He has given to us in His work. And we call Him a liar. In a sense, if we do that, we put ourselves on even keel with God to say, God, I can do what you require, which is your holiness, your perfection. And if I can do that, I make myself equal with God. It's a slap in the face of Almighty God to say that I can earn your favor. I can work my way to salvation. And God doesn't <laughs> merely accept good people. He radically saves sinners for his glory. 
And if we were going to come up with a system, I, I spoke of all those things at FD or at the Community Bible Church that we we have we we push our children to do. And those are good things, but what can we possibly come up with that would be good enough to appease a holy God, to atone for our sin? <coughs> Turn to Romans, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10. What can we possibly come up with? We already saw from Romans 4 that Abraham, although he may have done works to look good before men, even Abraham was counted righteousness, counted righteous, because he believed, because he trusted God. What system would we come up with? It could be better than God's. Even the law that God gave his people could never save. Even if they would have kept the law in the land as prescribed, that would not have been enough to atone for sin. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not a matter of becoming better than someone else or better than I was yesterday. God only accepts those who are made perfect. And these sacrifices could never do it. It isn't. For then they would not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. If the sacrifices that God prescribed could not take care of sin, how can the things that we choose to do, what could we possibly offer him? Continuing, it says, Therefore, when he came into this world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Again, these are what God prescribed for his people to do. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that we will all have been sanctified by that will by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The only atonement for sin, the only basis of forgiveness, the only way of salvation is Jesus Christ, our crucified Savior. And when he died on the cross, he didn't die to make a good people better. He didn't die to clean us up. He died on the cross bearing our sin, bearing our guilt, bearing our shame, he paid the price for our sin on the cross. And that's why Paul is able to take all these things that he once counted gain and put them in the lost column and say, all that matters on the gain sign is Jesus Christ. We have confidence not in our flesh, not in our rituals, not in our heritage, not in our keeping of the law. We have confidence that our Savior died for us. And we trust that when we stand before him, although perfectly and completely worthy of eternal damnation, guilty of every sin we've committed, that he bore that guilt, that he bore that shame, that he died to please the Father, to satisfy the wrath of a holy God that we deserve. This morning, if you are here, and you are trusting in anything that you have done, anything that you can do, can I ask you to consider the words of Scripture? Later on, the same writer, the Apostle Paul, would write to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We can't work for salvation. But God is gracious and gives it as a gift. In Titus 3, 5, he says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reminding us that salvation is entirely dependent on God. In Romans chapter 9, it says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, 
nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Today, if you are trusting in anything else, the faith of your parents, the things that you've done, the things that you will do, repent. Trust in Christ. Call out to him. Today, if we are trusting in him and in him alone, this isn't a passage to neglect, to look over for the person sitting next to us. There's a clear application for us. Go back to Philippians chapter 3. And the verse that sets this all up, verse 1, Philippians 3, 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. These truths should cause us to rejoice. It, there should always be that tension, that, that bittersweetness when we see the cross, when we celebrate communion, when we, when we think of what our Lord did on the one hand, it rattles us to think that our Savior would do these things, that He would endure that, that suffering. But it brings us great joy because we know that because He suffered, we're set free. We're no longer slaves to sin. Amen. The legal demands of the law have no claim on us anymore. We are forgiven. We have Christ. We have new life. He said, I have come to give life and life more abundantly. We ought to be a people that are full of joy, rejoicing always. But why don't we? So often we let our eyes be, be just consumed with the things that are too low. We fill our schedules every single second with things that we don't take time to think. We don't take time to com contemplate. We fall into the trap of, of God's the big genie in the sky that, oh, something bad happened, now i got to pray. Or something good might happen, so now i got to pray. Rather than stopping. There's a couple of my kids that just run frantically, and i got to say, stop! <laughs> don't move! <laughs> just stand still! But we live as adults, like three-year-olds, frantically running about, trying to find whatever it is that's going to make me happy right now. And we need to stop and be reminded. All of this is lost in view of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ my Lord. Turn to the um, Second Corinthians. I didn't plan on going to this passage, but I just... Then verse 7. It's so easy to get discouraged. And remember that the, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote 2 Corinthians, he had gone through some bad things. 2 Corinthians 4. He had been beaten, chased out of town, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, all kinds of just things that we would legitimately call bad things. He knew what suffering was. He says in verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Even in Galatians we read, the life we have isn't even meant to be ours. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. We know that from 1 Corinthians. We don't own it. It's bought and paid for by someone else. God owns us. He has rights to our very being. The life that we have is not our own, but Jesus now lives through us. Amen. It says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Remember Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all these things are for your sake, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. 
For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. <coughs> it says the things of this world are light affliction. They last only but a moment in light of eternity. He is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you. We know God. The creator of everything. He sent his son to die on our, on our behalf. He rose victoriously from the grave. And now seeks to live through us. Amen. And we become so consumed with the things that are lesser. When in fact everything that we approach in life is meant to be for his glory. That his life would be displayed through us. And as we reflect on these truths, we should rejoice. Do you take time regularly to reflect on the truths that God has given us? Or do you fill every minute with something? Car ahead of me, stop, pull out the phone. Red light, pull out the phone. Move the little blocks around. Oh. Class got canceled. Better sit on my phone for an hour. No power at work. Better play on my phone. Isn't that what people do anymore? We need to stop and rejoice. Maybe you don't have a habit of doing that. Can I encourage you to do that this week? Every day, plan on a time that you're going to get alone. Spend time reflecting on who God is. And maybe you don't know where to start. Start in Genesis. Just start somewhere. Start reading the Gospels. Maybe take your bulletin home. Look through the songs that we sang. Say, why did we sing that? Where is it in Scripture? What, what is this referring back to? You know, when I, I remember when I was a kid, well, all we had was like concordances in the back of the Bible, and those never, like, they had a lot of stuff, but it never had what you were looking for. Like, you're like, I know there's a verse somewhere that says something about this thing, and that's not there. Now we have Google. It's like even better than concordance. So you go take what you're looking for and say, Bible, I, I do that often. I can't remember a verse. Bible verses about blah, blah, blah. And then here's all these lists that I can go through and find what I'm looking at. But one way or another, spend time not just checking off a box. Again, we can do that, right? I read the Bible today. I prayed today. I got my 15 minutes in. I got my half hour in. And it, it becomes just a habit and it, or just work even. Yeah. But take time to, to, to reflect on what God's Word said. Maybe you don't get through all the chapters you wanted to. Maybe you don't read as much as you meant to. Maybe instead you only get through three verses, but you sit there and you think about how great God is and you praise Him for it. And I, can I encourage you, when God encourages your soul, tell somebody else. Pull your brother, your sister in the room and say, hey, look at this. Your mom, your dad, your wife, your neighbor. They don't even have to believe, just tell them. Testify to how good, how great our God is. In closing, I'd like us to read Psalm 32. Please stand with me. Psalm 32, I think, just captures at the beginning that blessedness that we have and so often forget about. And it moves towards where we so often are as foolish animals that it'll use the illustration of. So that it ends again with our call to rejoice. Psalm 32, starting in verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, but my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess the transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. 
Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with song, songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the salvation that you have graciously given to us through your Son. God, I pray that if there is anyone here today who does not yet know you, who is trusting in their heritage, their works, their deeds, whatever, Lord, that today you would open their eyes, open their heart, move them to their knees in true repentance, and God, save them. Lord, I ask for all of us who are trusting in you. Lord, there is always something in this world to fill the next minute. Always something promising to bring joy. Lord, let us not fall for it. Lord, let us not be like the horse and the mule that, that has to be dragged closer to you, that would run away if they had the opportunity. Lord, may we seek you daily. Lord, I pray that, that as your people draw near to you, as you have said you would, that you would draw near to them. God, that you would fill our hearts with joy, that we would overflow in gladness and joy, that we would sing and shout for joy to you, Lord. God, that we would proclaim your goodness to everyone we come in contact with. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.